Joining us now, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce CEO, Suzanne Clark, who's here on set with me. Suzanne, it's, it's great to speak with you. There's a lot to get to in this discussion, but I do want to start with labor because it really seems to have leverage right now. Are you monitoring UAW closely? Uh, how likely is it that we could actually see a strike? Well, first, thanks for having me. I'm always so happy to talk about the economy. You've put your finger on an important issue. We do think the Biden administration has got to keep both parties at the table. There is not a clear path forward. Keeping the people talking will be important. I think we have to remember this isn't just about the big three and about the UAW. In 2019, in the GM strike, the small and medium-sized business suppliers to the big three ended up laying off 75,000 people during that strike. So this is a potential for a really big impact. Um, so, so you're expecting a major economic impact if we were to see this move forward. I and mean, we've heard some analysts' numbers in the billions of dollars. You anticipate something similar? That's right. And what I really worry about is because of what we hear about every day from these small chambers and these small businesses is the impact nobody talks about, which is on these small job-creating community leaders across the country. What are you hearing from small businesses right now? Because we do know that those are the engine of job growth in the U.S. economy, and we're starting to see some signs that maybe the labor market is softening. It's so interesting because we just came out of the field with new research with MetLife, and what the small businesses tell us is record high optimism about revenue next year, record high optimism about their own ability to run their business and hire, and then kind of secondhand pessimism about what's happening in the rest of the economy and how that will impact them. Um, regulatory environment. You've been very outspoken about this all year, this idea of, I think, as you've put it, the, the overreach of the Biden administration. Uh, we've seen some high-profile court cases. There was one just today that actually involved uh, the chamber uh, against the CFPB, uh, successful for you and, and for the other um, industry associations that were involved as well. I, I guess walk me through what you mean by overreach and why this is unprecedented from your view. I think from our view, and what we hear from CEOs across the country is, it's just different in kind regulation, right? We have the SEC, a financial regulatory body, trying to regulate emissions. We have the FTC and the DOJ making it unclear which M&A work can go through and what can't. We have the FTC saying, we think we have the authority to regulate non-competes and competition. And so, to your point about the courts, using the courts to constrain the administrative state and say to these agencies, Agencies, you just don't have the authority to do this and create this kind of uncertainty in the economy is really important. Where does Congress fit into all this? I think that Congress needs to do this work because when Congress does it, it ends up surviving, right? When the agencies do it, it goes guardrail to guardrail in every administration, and that just leads to more uncertainty. So what we're looking for is for Congress to address the big issues, give limited jobs to the regulatory agencies to implement it, but these regulatory agencies then take it and say, wow, we're going to run with this and use a lot more authority than we think they, they were given. We've seen the industrial policy in this country as well like, expand pretty exponentially. Um, you could argue it started under the last administration. It's continued to grow under this administration. Um, it's meant some st potentially structural changes, dare I use the word, around how we're thinking about supply chain, interactions with China, uh, money that's going towards standing up, uh, more capabilities here in, in the U.S. Have we... Have we entered a new chapter in terms of U.S. Um, manufacturing? I hope not. I hope that the traditional base of free markets and capitalism and, and respect for business and job creators is really deep in the soul. You know, I don't know any member of Congress that doesn't care about job creation in their district. So we can always hope that cooler heads will prevail. But I think you're right. We have to be concerned when government wants to set prices. We have to be concerned when they're not doing the things they could do to help the economy. And instead, they're doing these things that constrain it and create uncertainty. It's interesting, though, because, and yes, we're still a year out from uh, the next election, but, but whether it is on the right or whether it is on the left, uh, there, is, there are certain things, for example, China, for example, supply chain and this notion of nearshoring and reshoring uh, that both parties are raising. But I think fairly, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked to Secretary Raimondo before her trip and after her trip to China. We thought it was important. She was having a dialogue with such a big trading partner and an important dialogue on all three areas. The red areas that, you know, the Chairman Gallagher at the House Select Committee has pointed out, the national security red lines we can't cross, the kind of danger zone yellow areas where China is, you know, using coercive efforts and new laws targeting American companies that need to be beaten back, IP theft, another good example, but also that there are 
green areas, that 99% of the trade has nothing to do with national security. And we need to trade ball caps and soybeans and burgers freely.